hello. Uh, tell me if you can hear me, because I know the mics are a bit choppy. I'm going to read from my novel, Hot Milk. Um, why is it called Hot Milk is something I'm often asked. I wrote an anthology of short stories called Black Vodka. And as it got translated around the world, my publishers took me to vodka bars. And then I wrote Hot Milk. Um, it's a book about many things, about hypochondria, about apparent psychosomatic illness, about mothers and daughters, um, about constellations, the Milky Way, um, Sophia Papastegiadis is 25 years old. No one can spell her surname or pronounce it. She uh, is on a modern pilgrimage with her mother, Rose Papastegiadis, who has some kind of limb paralysis. Sometimes she can walk, sometimes she can't. And they've come to the south of Spain to find a cure. One of the doctors, uh, Dr. Gomez, is sort of based on Charcot and Freud and a shaman, something between the three of them. Um, so Charcot famously had a pet monkey that he, that traveled with him through the wards and um, Dr. Gomez has a stuffed monkey in his consulting room um, because the nervous system of the monkey is apparently, according to him, quite similar to that of human beings. Um, and the question in the book is, is he a genius? Is he a quack? And the question for Rose, the mother, is she, is she ill? What's wrong with her? And Sophia, her daughter, who is her mother's camera in a way, um, has been a bit like Sherlock Holmes, a girl detective, trying to figure out from the age of four what's wrong with mum. In this, um, in these few pages, uh, this, this is called a case history. It's Gomez, the, Dr. Gomez's daughter, Julieta Gomez, who, um, who is going to take a case history from Rose. And there's a sort of running joke in the book uh, that she, she describes herself as a physiotherapist. And Sophia doesn't really think that what she does is very much like physiotherapy. The inspiration for the book came from a James Baldwin quote from his novel The Fire Next Time and I'll read it to you. I imagine that one of the reasons people cling to their hate so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone they will be forced to deal with pain. And I thought that could maybe be applied to symptoms. People cling to their symptoms so stubbornly because they sense once they've gone, they will be forced to deal with pain. The uh, person speaking here is Sophia, the daughter. My mother stands naked under the shower. Her breasts droop, her belly folds and folds again. Her skin is pale and smooth. Her hair is wet, her eyes are bright. She loves the warm water falling on her old body, her body. What is her body supposed to want? And who is it supposed to please? And is it ugly or is it something else? She is waiting for withdrawal symptoms from the lack of the three pills that have been deleted from her list of medication. So far, the symptoms have not arrived, yet she continues to wait for them like a lover, nervous and excited. Will she be disappointed if they don't turn up? 
Today, Julieta Gomez is going to take a case history of Rosa's body, and I have been asked to be present. Where does a case history start? It starts with family, Julieta Gomez says. It's history. It's a history. She has swapped her dove gray heels for trainers. Her thin chiffon blouse is tucked into tailored trousers which press tight against her hips. She walks my mother to a chair in the physiotherapy room and sits opposite her. Are you ready to make a start? Rose nods while Julieta fiddles with a small sleek black box lying between the desk. She has reassured my mother that this device was used for all the clinic audio archiving and it was confidential. So now the volume set levels were set. Apparently they would both soon forget that their conversation was being recorded. Julieta spoke first to give some facts. She noted the date, the time, my mother's weight, name, age and height. I sit uneasily in the corner of the physiotherapy room with my laptop on my knees, floating out of time in the most peculiar way. It seems wrong, even unethical, to have asked me to be here, but I had agreed to Gomez's request on the understanding that apart from Tuesdays, I would be free from the rest of her treatment. I have to pay for my freedom by listening to my mother's words. My love for my mother is like an axe. It cuts very deep. She is speaking. Her father had a temper problem, which can be confused with having high levels of energy, which can be confused with being manic. He needed no more than two hours of sleep a night. Her mother suffered from her father, which can be confused with depression. I know this history, but I don't want to be connected to it. I put on my headphones and gaze at YouTube on my shattered screen with all my life in it. Some of that life is the thesis for my abandoned doctorate that is lurking under the digital constellations made in a factory on the outskirts of Shanghai. Now and again, I lift off the headphones. My mother is giving a history of her present illness. Where does the history start? It moves around in time and merges into past history, childhood illness, and all the rest of it. This is not chronological time. Julieta will have to later transcribe Rosa's words and author her case history. I've been trained to do something similar, except I'm not a physiotherapist, I'm an ethnographer. Julieta will have to, at some stage, describe the complaint that brought the patient, my mother, to her clinic, symptoms and their presentation. It is not one complaint, it is not even six. I overheard 20 complaints, but there were more. The past, the present and the future are simultaneously present in all these complaints. Rose's Lips are moving and Julieta is listening, but I'm not listening. I've asked to be present, but I'm not present. I'm watching a Bowie concert from 1972 on YouTube and it is buffering while he sings. His hair is red like a blood orange. His glitter shirt is sparkling darkly to trigger associations of space travel and his platform shoes are stacked high to lift him off Earth. Bowie's painted eyelids are silver spaceships. Girls are screaming and crying and stretching out their hands to touch the space oddity strutting the stage. He is a freak like the Medusa. The girls are feral and fertile and freaked out. 
We are so pinned down on earth. If I had been there, I would have been the loudest screamer. I am still the loudest screamer. I want to get away from the kinship structures that are supposed to hold me together, to mess up the story I have been told about myself, to hold the story upside down by its tail. So it seems to me that there is a spectre haunting every photograph of um, the of of, of Charcot's, um, Charcot's performing women, um, and that spectre is us. It's all of us, and that's why they continue to be so so fascinating. Charcot's quote, um, maybe. It was Freud's favorite quote too, was theory is good, but it doesn't stop things from happening. Um, and this was something I was thinking about when I wrote the text for a short film that we're about to see, directed by my colleague, uh, Jane Thorburn. So you have to remember that Jane Thorburn just had a piece of paper in her hand and a few visual ideas that we shared, and she made everything else happen. So it's called uh, Freud's Lost Lecture, and I was quite amused when I uh, read transcripts of Freud's lectures at the University of Vienna. Um, the way he started was, ladies and gentlemen, and he ended, in conclusion, gentlemen. So I wondered where the ladies had got to. Um, and I won't say any more. Ladies and gentlemen, and especially the lady hysterics amongst you, I must thank you for achieving such articulate neurotic symptoms for my scrutiny. Your frozen limbs and the curious choreography of your words, the rich imagery you gave to me in the sealed envelope of your minds. I must thank you for the conscious access I was able to gain to the half-open doors of your childhood bedrooms, where porcelain ballerinas twirled in slow motion on the lids of your singing jewellery boxes. I would like to present to you a recent dream that caused me some consternation. I am going to leave it to you, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, to interpret this dream on my behalf. Two snow leopards with pale blue eyes made their way into the kitchen of my last house in Maresfield Gardens, London. There, my patissier from Moravia was preoccupied with baking my weekly supply of Florentines. She bent over to stroke the leopards, and when she saw they did not bite her, she poured warm milk into her cupped hands 
and made strange little noises in her throat while they lapped the cream with their moist pink tongues. When they had their fill, she fed them the nuts and cherries left over from my Florentines. I watched them purr as their white tails whipped her ankles and confess felt most unsettled when she sat on a chair and let them sleep across her bare feet under the table while she read the Psalms of St. Paul. At that moment I realized I was growing the spots that had been erased from the blank page of the leopard's white fur. Emerging on my hands and arms were grey circles that were becoming black as time went on, rather like a, a photograph developing. What was it I was wishing for in my dream? or, oh, indeed, wishing away. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, let me remind you once again of the ground we have covered in the course of 30 years of my lecturing at the University of Vienna. Just as the escalators of history rise and fall in the metro stations that map urban Europe, my intention has been to give the Western world the mechanism with which to descend to all that is repressed and shameful. Oh yes, it is perhaps not so much the ground we have covered as the underground we have covered. Our achievement is to ascend intact rather than broken and feel the wind near the exit sting the tears on our cheeks. <laughs>